Today I'd like to discuss Shabbat. Um, very broad topic, but uh, what I'd like to discuss is not nearly so broad. Uh, this is obviously of tremendous interest to all of us since for you professionally, many of you, the most significant parts of your professional lives are spent on Shabbat. Uh, beyond that, obviously, we want to encourage people in our communities, in our congregations, to devote themselves to observance of Shabbat in one way or the other in ways that many do not. Uh, and so uh, I think that this is a topic which is amongst the most important we can address. What I'd like to do, actually, is to suggest a different paradigm for discussing Shabbat. I think that we've been very influenced by one traditional paradigm, which has been translated then into a modern approach, and then some various alternatives, all of which have their value, but I'd like to argue are actually not only incomplete, but miss one of the most essential points. The traditional paradigm I have in mind is the notion that the work that's prohibited on the Sabbath is derived somehow from the work that was done uh, in connection to the building of the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the desert. Uh, that connection is certainly made in the sources we have, but it's only one of a variety of such connections. Heschel, of course, picked up on this in order to argue that the Sabbath represents Jews building sanctuaries in time and not in space. Uh, Heschel writes beautifully, and I think that he's on to something important there, but again, I would argue it's very incomplete. Uh, the third explanation, uh, maybe it's the second since Heschel is a, uh, a riff on the first, um, the, th the second explanation is one that I, I think many of us have both heard, uh, probably when we were very young, as we were first studying these things ourselves, and then we've taught ourselves, which is that the Sabbath is a time when productive work, creative work, as it were, is not to be done. Somehow we don't want to disturb the condition of creation. Again, uh, there's something to be said for that interpretation, but... I think it misses uh, the essential center. And what I'd like to argue, uh, what I'd like to offer based upon the sources I asked you to prepare, is that the essential center, if these sources are looked at afresh, is actually quite evident. Uh, there's no mystery here, but somehow in the additional levels of interpretation, we've missed the foundation. And I'd like to bring us back to the foundation. The first several sources I asked you to consider, putting the Mishnah aside, the Mishnah which lists the 39 categories of work, which the rabbis define as those categories which one is not permitted to do on Shabbat. Uh, these sources are interesting for the way they make it clear that the rabbis have a question here they're not fully able to answer. The question in both the Bavli and the Rishalmi is where do we get these 39 categories from? And there's something rather fanciful about it, because it's not simply sit down, examine the work done in the sanctuary, I'm sorry, in the tabernacle, um, and then you'll be able to figure out these categories of work. Um, the number wouldn't emerge from that. Even the precise descriptions wouldn't emerge from that. Uh, and so these Gemaras, in their semi-playfulness, I think, help us to remove one interpretation and open us up freshly to another. Uh, to begin with the Bavli, Avot Melachot Arba'im Chaser Achad Keneged Mi, these 39, where do we get them from? This is, as you know, 49b in Masechet Shabbat. Uh, the first answer is Keneged Melacha Melach Tau Melechet Shabbat Torah, count the number of times that the word malacha appears in its various forms, and you'll come up with the 39. Uh, as Tosfot notes, um, this is a little bit of an odd exercise. Why do we have to count the number of times? And their answer is that even if we have a source like the building of the Mishkan, still several of these acts of work in the list of the Mishnah are so close each to the other that it must be puzzling to anybody to figure out why do these count as avot, as main categories, rather than subcategories, or why 
uh, are each of the main categories and not one main category and then under them subcategories? The answer has to be in something else, argues Tosvot. And so coming back to the Gemara, maybe it's the number of times this word appears. You see then the discussion, the, you know, do we count this one, do we count that one? All very, very interesting. In the end, we actually don't know precisely how that works. The Gemara says teku. Uh, and then you've got a support of Baraita indicating that uh, there is at least some support to the notion that it is corresponding to the work, either Malacha or Avodah, which was done in the Mishkan. I suspect that this is the reason that we hear most often that the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is the source of the categories of work. But again, as we'll see going forward, this is very incomplete. The Yerushalmi has a very considerable overlap uh, with the Bavli. In this, again, it asks the question, minayin la'avot melachot mina Torah. Um, the first answer in the name of Rabbi Yonatan is keneged arbaim chaser achad melacha shekatu b'torah, almost identical to what we have in the Bavli, along with the argument. Um, but then we've got another discussion, or another suggestion, uh, Ultimately, b'shem Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachmani keneged arba'im chaser achad pa'am shekatuv b'mishkan avodah melacha. So we count not just the word melacha; we count also avodah. And then another suggestion: actually, we don't need any of this at all. Just look at the section which describes side by side Shabbat and then the work of the mishkan, and that begins with ele hadvarim asher tiva Hashem la asot otam sheshi amim tasem melacha, and then immediately after that section onto the mishkan. Uh, and the argument is mikan la avod ulitoldot. This is where we learn the main and subcategories from. How does that work? Uh, evidently, uh, what they have in mind, as the Yerushalmi here goes on, is the word Ela. That is to say, a gematria. Lamed is 30, uh, He is 5, Olive uh, is 1. That leads us to 36. Um, then you've got Dvarim, Hadvarim, which they can, you know, singular would be 1, 2, 3, uh, 36 plus 3, 39. All very nice. Um, a further response saying, no, actually, we don't need dvarim hadvarim at all because, uh, as we all know, he and chet are terribly close, and for purposes of gematria, as the Yerushalmi understands it, they can be used identically. So change the he to a chet, it becomes an eight, lamed is still 30, olive is still one, and you've got 39. Uh, what should be clear from all of this is they've got the 39 categories, They've got a tradition which connects it somehow to the Mishkan, but beyond that, they're actually quite at a loss to figure out where do these 39 come from, what makes something a general category uh, and, or a you know, main category, and what makes something else a subcategory. This is confounded, meaning the associations we take for granted, by virtue of the fact that um, we've got other texts suggesting alternative possibilities. Um, one, I want to plant this seed, uh, and I don't mean this as a play on words, but it, is re it could be a play on words. Um, on um, 74b, um, which I also, also ask you to look at, Rav Papa notes that halash um, v'ha'ofeh, kneading and baking, which is part of the list of prohibited works of the Mishnah, um, has no obvious connection in the Mishkan, in the work that was necessary for the construction of the tabernacle. And so he says, that the obvious actually, Tana didan bishul smam nim dahave shavak, I mean, he left this behind. He didn't talk about the cooking of the um, incense, the spices which were used in the Mishkan. He, that he ignored. But instead, v'nakat ofeh, Right? Why did he choose Ofeh? The answer is Tana Didan Sidura Depatnakat. The reason he did this is because what he really wanted to give us in the list of prohibited work in the Mishnah had nothing to do with the tabernacle. Rather, he wanted to give us the order of the baking of bread. Keep that in mind because we'll come back to it uh, in just a moment. I also asked you to consider, uh, and, and this you didn't have to look up because I printed it for you to just a brief two lines on the syllabus, the um, teaching which distinguishes malacha work, which is prohibited, 
from chokhma, uh, which we would translate as wisdom, but means, in this case, work that requires a special skill. This is very, very important because it also stands, I think, to refute the notion of creative work being what is assumed in these categories of malacha, Tana de Rabbi Yishmael, Lo kol malacha, that's the prohibition for Shabbat, don't do any kind of malacha without translating. Yatsat kiat hashofar urdiat hapat, shehi chokma ve'ena malacha. They understand the prohibition, uh, this teaching understands the prohibition, to apply to malacha, but not to chokma. Now, what does malacha mean? What it means is not blowing the shofar, and not this very interesting category called radiat hapat, related to baking, but we have to make some greater sense of it. Uh, it means the removal of the loaf from the sides of the oven, which was considered to be a special skill, um, one that not all bakers would have. To understand the work quite literally, if you've ever been to an Indian restaurant and seen them making the Indian breads in a tandoori oven, they'll take the dough and it will be thrown against the side of the oven where it will bake uh, relatively briefly, and then it has to be removed from the side of the oven where it's stuck. This is w what's described by this term, radiatapat. Uh, the translation for our terms would probably be something like the specialized skills in creating artisanal breads. That is to say that anything which is not fundamental, essential, doesn't count as malacha, doesn't count as the kind of work which is prohibited on Shabbat, and the categories which exemplify what work is not is this special skill in the baking of bread and the blowing of the shofar, which as we all know, not everybody can do. So it's not creative work, it's not artistic work. Uh, what is prohibited on the Sabbath, as the rabbis understand the word malacha, is work which is fundamental. Not the special, but what everybody needs and what therefore everybody can rely upon doing in one way or the other. This, I think, should help us understand the Mishnah quite immediately. So if you go um, to the Mishnah that we all know well, uh, but have probably not spent a lot of time going over uh, in recent years, because after all, we know it so well, uh, we've got the 39 categories of work. Arvot, Malachot, Arbaim, Chaser, Chad. So this is Mishnah Shabbat, Chapter 7, Mishnah number 2. So what do we find on the list? Hazorea, Vehachoresh, Vehakotzer, Vehamamer, Hadash, Vazorev, Vaborer, Hatochein, Vamaraket, Alash, Vahofe. And I stop there because I think that, as you'll see in a moment, it is uh, absolutely the only place to stop here. We could understand each of these as a separate category. So we begin at the beginning and we've got planting and um, plowing, it probably should be in the opposite order, that is say plowing first and then planting, uh, though these acts were simultaneously more or less because you would have the plow which would go through, which would dig the groove and lay down the seed at the same time. Hakotzer, when the grain grows, it would be cut, harvested, amer, piled up, dash, zoreh, borer, the several categories, all of which are necessary to separate the wheat from the chaff uh, and then to have the finer wheat, which would be ground. So tochen comes next. Um, Merakeid, the ground wheat, which has become flour, uh, would then be sifted, a further act of differentiation to take out some of the waste material. Then with the sifted flour, halash, add the water and you would knead it. Veha'ofe, all of this, of course, would produce the dough, which in the end could be baked. Now, to be sure, we could list this and see it as separate categories. But what we've got here clearly is not separate categories at all, but rather what? Well, it's a narrative. And it is the narrative, the story, if you will, uh, of the production of bread. So not looking at each of the words, looking at what the words create together, the first category we've got here is the baking of bread. Of course, in the ancient world, as in the modern, baking of bread is about putting food on your table, right? Breaking bread is about having a meal. 
Then you've got the next list, and again, it's not separate categories, but a list. Listen to the way they come together, and I think that we've got here once again a narrative. Hagozez et atzemer, shear the wool, milap no, white it, literally, I mean, you have to wash it, minap tzvo, vahatsov o, you clear out waste material, um, color it, dye it to whatever color you would need, tove vamesach, um, make the wool then into threads, spread the threads um, or yarn out on a loom, um, and then you weave together cloth. That's the next several categories. Vareg shnei chutin, potseya bet chutin, kosher v'hamatir v'hatofer shtei tefirot v'koreya almanat lead four. Create the fabric. Sew the fabric together when you've gone too far or when it doesn't quite fit, because, of course, fabric needs to be sewn together to fit the body of the person for whom the clothing is being created. Um, so it will involve both sewing and the cutting of threads in order to create the final garment. Um, and when you finally create the states he wrote, this is the minimum, um, you will be well on your way to the creation of clothing. So... Narrative number two is clothing. Um, narrative number three uh, is actually a little bit surprising because it begins with Hatsad Sfi, uh, hunting uh, and capturing a deer, and we think, oh, okay, so we're in the production of meat uh, and food once we've set up the prior narratives, but actually the rabbis don't have that in mind at all. Tzad Sfi, Vashokto, Mavshito, remove the uh, hide. Molcho, salt the hide, Ma'abed et Oro, um, this is the preparation of the hide, mochko, uh, removing the hair from the hide, mechatcho, cut it. Um, in order to do what? Now listen, this is part of the same narrative. Hakotev shte otiot, vamochek almanat lichtov shte otiot. This has all been the production of parchment because parchment is needed to write on. And of course, when we write on parchment, we know that we are involved in the creation of sacred scrolls, sacred texts. This is the third narrative. Then you've got building. Um, a couple of things left over, actually. Hamav uh, Irva, um, yeah, things related to fire uh, go back to the Torah itself. That, that is to say, there are actually a couple of things that the Torah mentions, one of them being the making of fire. And then, interestingly, say Mirshut Lirshut, while this is not in the Torah, carrying from one uh, domain to the other, every source after the Torah that mentions any kind of prohibited Sabbath work uh, mentions carrying first and foremost. In fact, sometimes carrying is the only prohibited work that it indicates because going back to Nehemia uh, and other sources clearly represents doing business on the Sabbath. Uh, so these are, as it were, the leftover. But essentially, the majority, all but the last few, uh, of the categories here uh, give us a story. And in case you should have any doubt uh, that the story, uh, the narrative, is as I suggest. This is why I asked you to look at the text in Brachot uh, 58a, which is intimately related to this Mishnah of Shabbat and makes it very, very clear what we are talking about. Ben Zoma ra'a uchlusa al gav ma'ala baharabait. So he saw a large uh, crowd uh, of people on their way up to the Temple Mount, uh, ben Zoma did, and he said in response to seeing them, first the bracha that the Gemara just above this indicates should be said upon seeing a large crowd, Baruch HaCham um the many, many deot, the many minds that these people have are mysterious and wonderful, and therefore it's worth saying a bracha for this great variety and mystery. But then he says, Baruch Shabara Kol Elil Shamsheni, blessed be the Lord who created all of these to serve me. He was in favor of division of labor in a complex society. Huaya Omer, Kama Yigiot Yaga Adam Arishon Ad Shamatsa Patlechol. How much hard work did the first person, Adam Arishon, have to do until he had bread to eat? Harash Vizara Vikatsar Vamar Vidash Vizara Uvarar Vitachan Vihirkid Vilash Vafa. Right? What we've got here is almost the complete list that the Mishnah gives us in virtually the identical order, just rendered past tense here because it's talking about Adam HaRishon. He had to do each of these things in order to produce bread. 
ואני משכים ומוצא כל אלו מתוקנים לפניי. All of these are already prepared for me. Thank God for the baker on the corner. וכמה יגיעות יגע אדם הראשון עד שמצא בגד ללבוש. How much hard work did he have to do until he found um, clothes to wear? גזז וליבן ונפץ וטבע והרג. It doesn't give us the full list, but again, in the same order as we have in the Mishnah. ואחר כך מצא בגד ללבוש, and then he had um, something to wear. So what does the Mishnah tell us then? The Mishnah suggests that what is prohibited on the Sabbath is not creative work, is not artistic work. It's the following categories of work. The production of food, the production of clothing, the production of shelter, that's building that we have in the Mishnah. So food, clothing, shelter, a combination that we all recognize because what we're really describing here is subsistence work, essential work that creates uh, the fundamentals that every human being needs. Uh, and added to that, since the rabbis, after all, were living in a society, um, <laughs> their own society, where they had their own unique narrow view, they also considered essential subsistence work, as it were, um, to be the creation of sacred scrolls. Or to put that uh, in a somewhat different frame, uh, they're describing here what is absolutely essential for the continuity of life as they saw it. Uh, and that essential is food, clothing, shelter, and Torah. Uh, it's essential that we go back and recall that the Torah says almost nothing about what's prohibited on the Sabbath. It simply gives us this category of malacha, tells us, amongst other things, that we can't light fire, but very, very few specifics. And so each generation of Jews had the opportunity for themselves both to take an inherited tradition as it developed over the course of the centuries, uh, but then to offer new interpretations uh, on their own. And what we've got in the Mishnah is the rabbi's unique interpretation. While some of it uh, includes inherited specifics, particularly the carrying prohibition, as I mentioned, this precise combination and the pattern, the organization that they provide, as well as many of the specifics, are new and unique to the rabbi. So this is their interpretation. The question, therefore, is how are they interpreting the Sabbath and what it prohibits? It seems to me clear that in their mind, the Sabbath is a day, and now I'm going to offer two takes on the same interpretation, A and B, where first, everything essential is already provided. And so we don't need to do for ourselves on the Sabbath the things that essential survival would demand because those things have already been provided. Uh, this is a day where the world is sufficiently perfect that we don't need to struggle uh, to survive. We don't need to struggle to provide for ourselves our subsistence. We have food, we have clothing, we have shelter, and we have Torah. We don't need luxury. It's not about luxury. What we need is the essentials of life, and we've defined them in these categories. And so the question we have to ask ourselves in our world is, what's essential for us? Because the Sabbath is the day that we pretend. This is a role play, as it were, but it's a very, very serious role play. We um, play as though everything we need absolutely and essentially is provided for us. Uh, and so the teaching opportunity, uh, and it's an introspective opportunity for each of us, is to ask, what is absolutely essential as far as we're concerned? When we can define what's absolutely essential, we can say these are the things that we can't do on the Sabbath. We must be sure that they are prepared for us before the Sabbath so that we can sit back and take advantage of a world where everything essential is provided. Is it family? Is it certain kinds of leisure? Uh, we will in our communities interpret this as we like, but that, I think, is the most important question. Uh, now to take it on to part B. We have to ask ourselves, uh, regarding the rabbi's interpretation, uh, did they have something more specific in mind? And by that I mean, was there a time, or will there be a time in history, when everything essential was or will be provided, because that's what they're saying the Sabbath is, a time during which we pretend everything essential is already there for us. Well, when did this happen? It happened in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. Uh, everything was provided. It happened, uh, I think, more immediately in uh, Israelite history in the desert. 
uh, when we were in this unique and new relationship with God and everything was provided by God in that wilderness over the course of the 40 years. Uh, you'll recognize, by the way, uh, that here the liturgy picks up on precisely uh, those times. It's Zechel Masebreshi, Sabbath is. It is a recollection of creation, that is to say, Garden of Eden. It is also Zechel Itziat Mitzrayim. It's a recollection of our coming out from Egypt. And so the role play is a play which brings back the perfect times, or if you will, the more perfect times, um, when those things were provided by God, we didn't need to pro provide them for ourselves. And finally, uh, and I think this is crucial, when's the last time we'll experience that? Of course, in Olam Haba. Everything will be provided, and that's why the Sabbath is described as me'en ha'olam haba, a taste, as it were, of the world to come. Uh, so now the question becomes, uh, what's the perfect world? How do we imagine it? We can't have it now, but on the Sabbath, we are meant to imagine a taste of that perfection, be it a perfection that we experienced in the past or a perfection we'll experience in the future. If we ask ourselves, what do we need, essentially, uh, and having that provided our world is near perfect, we will have defined the Sabbath. If that's the fundamental question, without any other prejudice, I promise that we ourselves and those in our communities and congregations will come up with uh, a series of acts and even prohibitions that will protect this taste uh, of a perfect world, uh, and they will be observing the Sabbath much in the spirit uh, of the Sabbath that the rabbis themselves created in their new and unique interpretation. I'll see you next time.